Hello everyone and welcome to this Meet the World event held by the National Centre for Writing in the United Kingdom with the kind support of the National Arts Council of Singapore. I'm your host, Juliet Jakes, and today I'm joined by two of my favourite queer writers, one from the United Kingdom and one from Singapore. Daryl T. Lin Yam was born in 1991 and is a writer and arts organiser from Singapore. He's most recently the author of the novella Shanti 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 in 2021, which was shortlisted for the 2022 Singapore Literature Prize, and the novel Lovelier Lonelier in 2021, a finalist of the 2021 Epigram Books Fiction Prize. He is also a co-founder of the literary non-profit Singlet Station. Hugh Lemmy was born in Barrow in Furness in Cumbria in England in 1986 and is a novelist, artist and critic currently living in Barcelona. He is the co-author with Ben Miller of the book Bad Gays, A Homosexual History, published by Verso Books in 2022, based on their popular podcast of the same name. He's the author of three novels, Unknown Language, 2020 Ignosa Books, Red Tory, My Corbin Chemsex Hell, published by Montez Press in 2019, and Chubbs, The Demonization of My Working Ass, published by Montez Press in 2016. Hugh writes on culture, sexuality and cities for The Guardian, Freeze, Flash Art, Tribune, Tank, The Architectural Review, Art Monthly and Art Review, amongst others. He writes the regular essay series on sex and culture, Utopian Drivel. As an artist and filmmaker, his work has been shown at Studio Voltaire, the ICA, Lux Biennial of Moving Image, Moomot Vienna, Warsaw Museum of Contemporary Art and the Design Museum in London. And I, Juliet Jakes, am a writer and filmmaker born in Red Hill and Surrey in 1981 and currently based in London. I published four books, including Trans and Memoir, Verso 2015, a short story collection, Variations, published by Influx Press in 2021, and most recently Frontlines, Trans Journalism, 2007-2021, published earlier this year by Cypher. My fiction and journalism essays have appeared in numerous publications and my short films are screened across the world. I teach at the Royal College of Art and elsewhere. So Hugh, Daryl, thanks for joining me. Um, I'm going to start with, uh, with a somewhat basic question, which is what attracted you to literature in the first place? Daryl, I think I'll start with you. I mean, I always grew up reading books, but I think there wasn't really an imperative to read deeply and more seriously until I suppose, you know, like, I mean, I, I did get bullied in school for like, I think 12 years, but things didn't really come to a head until I guess a group of friends, yeah, really began targeting me. And I think that's when I told myself I had to kind of leave behind, you know, the usual trappings of fantasy, you know, which is what I, you know, when, when you're a teenager, you're reading that all the time. And I just wanted to, I don't know. Be something a bit more serious, so to speak. And I remember um, we have this bookstore called Kino Kunia in Singapore. And I just remember taking myself away from the fantasy section towards the, I think the literature section. Yeah, starting from A. Literally A, because you know all the surnames A to Z. And that's when I started reading Margaret Atwood. And then I remember reading Cat's Eye. That was my first ever book. Um, and then after that, I consumed everything by her. And then that's how I kind of began moving down the shelf, so to speak, you know. So yeah, that's how that's how I came to really love literature. And the other the other answer also has to do with a lot to do with like just the teachers that I've had. Um, I have this one teacher, Mr. Brian Connor. He was really he was really incredible, and I remember he was teaching us this really eclectic range of books in school. Like he was teaching us Huckleberry Finn, Paddy Clark, Ha Ha Ha, and Siddhartha which is an incredible combination of books to be teaching. But I remember the way that he spoke about all of these books and how they functioned, you know, in terms of like the effect of syntax, literary devices, sort of all, all those kinds of things. He spoke about it like it was magic, you know, the way that they affected our understanding of story and also the way it affected our emotion, our emotional response to the story. He talked about it all like it was magic and I too thought it was magic. So yeah, it was all these... These are the two main things that kind of got me into literature. Yeah, Wonderful. Thank you. And uh, Hugh, how about you? You know, it's funny you say it's a basic it's... question, but I'm not sure I've ever been asked it before. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I really wasn't particularly bookish as a kid. I, uh, maybe maybe as a young kid, I was sort of into, into reading, but I was definitely one of those, um, those boys that you sort of read about in newspapers as like a problem. 
of, of, uh, of young men who don't read at all. So from probably the age of sort of 12 or 13, when I started going to high school, uh, until my mid-20s, I, I kind of wasn't really into literature that much. Um, and it was something I sort of discovered like quite a bit later, maybe 10, 10 years ago or so, in my mid-20s, and came back to, um, partly as a result, as a result of, um, of, of writing and realizing, oh, the best way to learn how to write is also to, to be reading other people's work as well. Um, so I do feel, I do feel sometimes I have a bit of imposter syndrome. I'm sort of catching up a, quite a lot and, uh, yeah, re, re, reading back, try to fill in, fill in the gaps, um, which, uh, yeah, makes me feel very strange sometimes because I'm sort of encountering things that I think a lot of people maybe experience and are quite formative in their, in their teenage years. Whereas for me in my teenage years, I was sort of stuck with, um, uh, the capture of the Reich. I was one of those sort of, you know. That that got me, but not much else. Um, so yeah, I remember a couple of years ago, in fact, um, starting to read um, uh, read Bronte, which I sort of did as a sort of part part of this worthy, you know, you know, I should I should read the classics, even though they can be <laughs> terrible, terrible and boring, and then just being like, whoa, <laughs> this is amazing! I'm really into this. So yeah, that's my that's my story already. Well, uh, yeah, I think everyone should read The Capture of the Rye as a teenager, actually. Um, no, yeah, definitely. But um, but anyway, yes, uh, thank you both uh, for that. So I guess the next question is, you know, both of you um, are interested in queer people, queer culture and queer subjects. So can we talk a bit about, you know, what has compelled you to write about those and about LGBT life? And uh, again, Daryl, I'll come to you first, I think. Sure. Um I think that question has to kind of do with why I write and who I write for, uh, which is a question that gets asked quite often. And I 100% always say, without shame, that I always write for myself. You know, um, uh, I if I if I were if I were to ever write for anyone else, it would have to be for someone who maybe thought and felt about the world like me <laughs> again it's a very selfish thing to admit um but I, I i do i say i say it and admit it all the time um and so i think i think again going back to this bullying that i experienced i did i did kind of have to go through a kind of tumultuous period of real self-examination um and i think every time i ever felt tormented or made to question my self worth. Um, there was always something a bit more tenacious within me, I suppose, that constantly drew me back to that belief in myself, you know, and my, my belief in my self worth. And I don't know, I always, I always was a very happy kid, joyous, you know, and and maybe a part of that joie de vivre has to, has to do with being queer in some sort of way, you know. And every time someone tried to kind of tell me otherwise. I always came back to the idea that no, there's something here worth, worth keeping, worth treasuring, worth nurturing, and that naturally bled its way into how I write fiction too, you know, um, without even trying. I think each of my books, like literally on the first page, you'd see a gay person. Um, whether or not I delve deep into their sexuality is a completely different question altogether, but for me, it was never a question that each of my books would begin with a the homosexual <laughs> and and yeah and I, I feel like not to not to not to not to beat around the bush so to speak but I just feel like I can't really imagine a world without people like us you know and so I think yeah that's, that's just naturally how I've begun writing stories so yeah <laughs> Thank you. Um, and yeah, Hugh, um, how about you? Um, I think my interest comes partly from seeing such a massive sea change in the attitude towards, especially towards gay men in the UK, but, but towards LGBTQ people in terms of visibility and culture over the last 20, 25 years. Um, and, and growing up, how gay men were represented um, for me. And the positives of that, obviously, um, uh, that, that in general, the sort of general visibility of gay men in the UK is probably better than it ever was. 
Um, and the, 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 you can speak better to this, Julia, but the, the visibility of trans people is also, um, they're much more part of uh, the public discourse, yeah. but unfortunately <laughs> in an extremely, extremely negative, uh, negative way. Uh -oh. But the, at the same time, you'll have seen, I'm sure, like uh, in the same way, m many more positive representations of what it means to be gay. But for me also, that, that coming of this, this, um, this negative side, which is that the representations in some way feel that like they come a lot more shallow. Um, that previously you'd see gay men on screen largely if they were written by gay men. And so that there was an enormous amount of sort of complexity and um, uh, uh, about those lives. And they tend to be quite realistic in some ways, you know, like I'm thinking of something like Queer as Folk, uh, which is a, one of the earliest sort of TV representations I remember seeing of British gay men. And the the relationship between those, I mean, first of all, it was a TV program about gay men, which in which most of the characters were gay men. Um, and they were sort of cruel and funny and, um, you know, falling in love and treating people badly. And they were, they were reasonably well-rounded, whereas I feel like as people have become more keen to, like, give positive representation of, of gay people, they tend to sort of sanitize what it means. And also that now when you do see a lot of representations of gay people, there's a, a gay friend, which is a big thing for me, this sort of thing that you see, which is like in any TV show, for example, or film, there's a gay friend character. And that gay friend's friends are all straight. This is complete misrepresentation of gay life to me. And, and, and that's why I also want to write about is that like gay people hang out with other gay people and talk about gay things mm -hmm. and talk about, you know, how much they dislike straight people a lot of the time. <laughs> And uh, and they're cruel to each other sometimes, and they 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 you know they can treat each other badly, and they can they treat each other lovingly, but it's it's complex. And I think a lot of that complexity of of gay life has been erased, ironically, uh -huh. as gay people have become more visible in the in the media. So, so I, that's that's kind of how I try to write, and I think um, all my books are marked by having some pretty unpleasant gay men in, um, which is. Um, part of writing from life i guess yeah absolutely um the really really interesting and thought-provoking cue and we'll we'll come back to some of those points in a bit uh daryl i want to sort of come back over to to you now uh and i guess it's sort of provide a contrast or point of comparison with some of what hughes just said um so i want to ask you like how you would describe life for lgbt plus people in in Singapore, sort of during your adolescence and adulthood, and what you hope to achieve by writing about it? Yeah, so, <clears throat> well, I think this year was kind of a historic year because we finally had the Penal Code Section 377A kind of abolished by the government. Um, for reasons we still don't know why, really. Yeah, um, but I think in contrast to what you said, um, there is very strict media control, I suppose, over queer representation, uh, particularly in the media. And by media, I do mean radio, TV, uh, even in film. Um, sometimes it happens in a musical, like, I think there was like a gay kiss in like a very famous musical that had to be like, excised uh, when it was brought to Singapore. Um, but... Uh, there, it, there are explicit rules, you know, um, kind of preventing media from showing positive portrayals of queer people. So if there were any representation of queer folk on TV, it would have to be kind of negative. I think quite recently, the hell this like, there was, a, there, was a, there was a Chinese drama, the Chinese channel's called Channel 8. We have this Channel 8 drama that kind of really had this gay person be this kind of like philandering disease spreading guy and it was like so it was so calling but that's just how backward it is right now in singapore and i do feel like again to go back to why i write right it's kind of mainly because outside of the media especially in artistic spheres like like the theater or in fiction or in poetry uh, there isn't so much control so to speak over how gay people are represented and i think i was lucky enough to kind of receive uh uh, in my hands, this trilogy of plays by the playwright Eleanor Wong. She's a lawyer and a playwright, and she wrote um, this trilogy of plays centered on lesbian life. And I remember reading it when I was 18 and just thinking, oh, I can do this. This is where I can be free, you know? Um, so I think 
by trying to write about queer people, uh, I just feel like it's almost like an imperative, really, because what else is there, so to speak? And mm-hmm. again, you know, it's a kind of how do I say this? Being the artist in Singapore, it can blind, it can, it can, it can blind you to certain realities of life, like right? because um, there's so many of us queer folk in the art scene that sometimes you would see a lot of queer stories kind of proliferate. And sometimes when you are amidst this kind of proliferation, you're constantly exposed to these kinds of queer stories, it can kind of make you blind to the fact that for a lot of people who don't exist or are even in contact with the arts, um, that privilege isn't necessarily extended to them, you know? So I think just going back to why I write, it, it's really about just trying to just, you know, do something about it, I guess. Um, yeah. Yeah. Did I miss another part of your question, Julia? Uh, <laughs> no, no, but I do have another question for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is, uh, I wondered if I could ask you about the um, the Sing Lit Station project that we mentioned earlier yeah. that you uh, yeah. co-founded and, like, its role yeah. in literary culture in Singapore more widely and what you're trying to achieve with that. Yeah, okay, so... Um, well, uh, this poet, Joshua A. And this other writer, John Gresham, we decided to kind of start this literary nonprofit together called Singlet Station, uh, mainly to kind of do two things really, to really promote local literature and to advocate for the development of local literature. Um, this kind of treads back to a little bit about what I was saying earlier. Um, uh, because of the way, I don't know, we've grown up in terms of media consumption, a lot of Singaporeans aren't necessarily in tune with their local culture. Um, we are very much, in fact, awash with international culture. Um, a lot of the shows and the movies and the TV, sh- uh, the TV things that we watch, the music we consume, it's international. Uh, truly, like, we have people who love American, British, European, Korean, Japanese, everything, everything except Singaporean. Um, and this obviously applies to literature. Like, I feel like if you ever caught anyone reading on the train, which is already quite a rare sight, they wouldn't be reading local literature. They'd be reading something else, you know? And so I think the reason why we started this nonprofit really was to kind of um, make sure that, you know, we have as many people as possible coming into contact with local literature in some sort of way. Um, and then on the other hand, we do t- kind of turn to our own local authors and see how we can kind of communally improve one another's works and give each other more economic opportunities you know so we we have this like uh school workshop program where we constantly send writers to schools um, we also conduct uh workshops and master classes we have residencies fellowships all those kinds of things just to give local writers a bit of cash you know to just go through the day because not because of the way singapore is not a lot of us are also full-time writers we just can't afford to you know i think if I were to describe the state of local literature in a nutshell, is I'll do it with just one number. A typical print run would be a thousand copies. Then it wouldn't sell out. So that's just the state of things in this country. So yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um I'm going to turn to you now, Hugh. Um I sort of mentioned earlier about how your work often cuts through the the sort of myths or the stories or, you know, if you're feeling less charitable, uh, lies that the United Kingdom tells itself uh, and tells about itself as a sort of apparent beacon of LGBT tolerance. Um, do you think this is a fair summary of um, of things in the UK? If so, what are these myths and how does your work aim to challenge them? Um, what are the myths? The myths, the myths are that largely the struggle has kind of been won. There isn't really much homophobia. The homophobia as it exists is kind of limited to like a certain type of like probably working class male culture, which is like just inherently more homophobic and racist than like the enlightened middle classes uh-huh. and, and ruling class. And that internationally, I guess that the UK is sort of one of the countries that has paved the way for... Um, LGBTQ rights around the world. Um, that is, it feeds, I think, into a racist myth that the UK is more civilized, and there's not a lot of willingness for for the for, for British people in general, I think, to look back honestly at its history. 
whether that's on LGBTQ rights, obviously, or um, oh, more generally, <laughs> more generally in its, I mean, in literally any sphere of its history, you could look back on it. Uh, so, but I think that, that ties into a, an, another thing, which is like just generally the myths that the British tell about themselves and the, the, that the British media tells about itself. Like, I was very struck by a lot of that or regarding like Brexit and the recent uh -huh. like debates around Brexit, how, how much there was this sort of belief that, um, that the rest of the world is as concerned with the British, with the British as the British are, you know, like that, that, that then the, 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 the primary objective of European countries is to make sure that Britain gets a fair deal, for example. <laughs> um, and a lot of those stories, I think, I think the thing that's really un unique about the UK compared to a lot of other countries is the role of its its print media. Uh, there has such a strong history of such a a powerful uh, centralized print print media that is so the the I guess in America is probably the mo the movie industry is this plays this role, but America doesn't have this same relationship in print media. Whereas in the UK, so much about like what Britain is, who British people are. The, 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 the current debates and things like that they're not actually shaped by television or, or, or radio so much they're shaped by print media and for me that's like a real jumping off point of um, a lot of my writing um, especially my first two books Chubbs and Red Tory is really like a lot of uh, the ideas for, for that were let's just take the British uh, print media at its word that the stories that it tells are true and try and imagine what that world would look like uh, so that's the world they're set in is like a world is the world that the, the British print media try to pretend England is, I guess, or Britain is. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the starting point for me. Um, I think, I mean, I think like actually the current, the current moment we're just recording this um, at the start of the World Cup in Qatar. And I think it's like a really good example. I wrote something about this week yeah. of exactly how, how Britain and especially English see themselves, which is as a very tolerant uh, nation towards LGBTQ people. Um, and so the, the 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 captain of the England football team was saying he was going to wear this uh, armband on the pitch, uh, which has a uh, rainbow, a sort of rainbow heart in it, with the, the very timid statement "One Love," which is a sort of very watered down sort of pro LGBT statement that doesn't actually mention anything to do with LGBTQ people. But um, but it was sort of in opposition to uh, the way that the British. The, the Qatar state, I guess, and the way that the British media has focused on the Qatar state as being some somehow primitive and backwards because of its relationship to LGBT, LGBTQ people. Now, obviously, the, the state in Qatar is extremely oppressive to uh, LGBTQ people, but mainly its own citizens, not not England football fans. Um, but secondly, that they backed down on this the moment there was any sort of pressure. The pressure they put on England players not to wear this, the FIFA put on them, was you might get a yellow card. I think that's very telling. Like, I think that is kind of the extent to which the English especially like to think of themselves in relationship to like their tolerance and LGBTQ culture, which is, yeah, we'll wear it. We'll wear an armband if we can prove that we're more advanced than um, these, these backwards Arabs. But uh, we don't care enough about LGBTQ people to get a yellow card. That's where we draw the line. So actually their own tolerance, like I think, I think actually that's a lot because a lot of the, the sort of relationship with um, the, the wider public with LGBTQ people has changed so much in the last 20 years. It's not coincidentally that it's it, that's occurring at the same time as the war on terror, uh, the measures of the war on terror and its relationship that, that the British uh, sort of general public had towards embracing LGBTQ people specifically as a sort of marker of their uh, advanced uh, civilized status in compared to in compared, and so so you will have have this discussion a lot. And if you bring into this discussion at any point the fact that, for example, huge numbers of the the laws uh, prohibiting LGBT soft or prohibiting same sex activity across the world in former British colonies were in were written by the British, they all have the same same wording in those in those penal codes. Uh, you'll suddenly get quite a strong and often quite violent reaction yeah. from people who claim to care about LGBTQ people because they care, but they're not, not enough to hear someone insult the British about it. You know, they want to rewrite their history on that sort of thing. So um, that's kind of uh, this sort of quiet, no, this loud claim of toleration that actually is pretty skin deep yeah. 
is kind of what what marks the the, the sort of current attitude in the UK towards LGBTQ people, which which yeah, gives a certain degree of toleration, um, but but very quickly can can turn quite nasty, as we've seen in the last sort of five or ten years around its it, the the print media's relationship with uh, the issue of trans rights and trans sort of justice and healthcare and things. It's become um, one of the most toxic places in the world for that sort of discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and obviously there's plenty I could say about that and indeed have done uh, elsewhere. But um, I'm uh, I'm very much in the role of uh, presenter and host today, so I will uh, leave the audience to uh, to find my uh, my writings on that. Um, Daryl, I know you've spent like some time studying and um, staying in the United Kingdom. So I just wondered if you had any, uh, you don't have to, of course, but if you had any uh, responses to that or or if you you know that raised any interesting parallels for you yeah. with um with life elsewhere yeah um i mean i wouldn't be lying if i didn't say that um when i found out i was gonna you know study at the university of warwick i didn't think like i'd have a chance to actually find off you know spread my little gay wing <laughs> i remember my dad <laughs> my dad he, he just took me to a corner, like, I think, like, in the week I was going to leave. And he just said, you know what, uh, over there, right, they, in the ass, you know, <laughs> I, just, I couldn't, I couldn't help but laugh in my father's face. It was so funny. I was like, oh, my God, I hadn't even properly come up to him yet. <laughs> and I was just like, okay, sure. Well, we'll see if that happens, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, and, like, again... I was in I was in Coventry. I was in Leamington Spa, you know. Um, so I wouldn't say that it was a very happening gay place, um, but definitely I experienced all my first there. Credits to the UK for that. Love it. Love love it so much. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, yeah, and 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 um, couldn't be more grateful for that. But I think I think ultimately. I don't know, like, you carry your own baggage wherever you go, you know? Like, why why did it have to be the case that me, this, like, guy in his early 20s, cro- encroaching into his late 20s, still an undergrad, had to experience his first kiss in front of all these basic, ba- all these teenagers, basically, you know? Like, and, 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 I don't know, I had all these, I still had all these hang-ups that had to kind of detangle and, 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 that was definitely something that I basically had to struggle with, personally speaking. And um, I, I did manage to kind of, you know, um, stick out of life elsewhere. There was a, aside from the UK, I did manage to quite notably spend um, a residency in Seoul once. And yeah, dating there was interesting. It was very interesting. Again, also very closeted. Um, and then it it wasn't extremely liberating in any sort of way. And Again, you just kind of see everywhere you went, you know, like, again, how people kind of carry that shame with them. Um, aside from Korea, I got to spend a year in Japan. That in itself was its own little, like, weird little situation. And I never really felt fitting in, like, you know, going clubbing in Nichome and stuff like that. So as a young person, again, I just knew that I had to reckon with whatever Singapore kind of instilled with me, within me as a, as a young child. And, you know... Again, to bring up 3778, that was a kind of colo- colonial inheritance that we received. Um, um, and um, people often talk about whether or not this particular penal code has had any actual real effect on the lives of queer men in Singapore. Because um, it's extremely debatable. I think in the 90s, it was definitely very much enforced. Um, performance art was definitely banned. Um, um, all kinds of things, raids took place all the time. And then suddenly in the 20th century, things just kind of stopped. And then the government started taking this entirely different stance about the, the, the penal code. And, and they were saying like, oh, we'll just have a close one eye policy and pretend nothing happens. Um, and so how do you straddle yourself between these completely different treatments of queer folk and queer life in Singapore? And to be specific, 3 Sensei is about... Um, criminalizing anal sex between men. But, and then, because it's so specific to gay men, again, people like to say that, oh, it doesn't really affect, I guess, the other, you know, sections of the queer community, right? Um, But, I think, 
now that it's finally being abolished, we're still trying to understand right now. I think right now the queer community in Singapore is trying to grapple with um, uh, what life is like after 3778. And for now, all we can, all we know is that the government is very keen to make sure that even though we have abolished this rule, they're still very much invested in the idea of entrenching heterosexuality as, you know, the defining norm of marriage and that kind of thing. And um, so if you ask me how life was like spent elsewhere, I would say I definitely very much entertained this idea of freedom, but it was still ultimately just an idea, you know, um, any kind of detangling that I had to do on my own, I had to do on my own. You know, it didn't matter wherever I went. You know, and sometimes when I do enter a country like Japan or, or Korea, for instance, sometimes you kind of hit a little too close to something that you've already felt back in Singapore, you know, in a place where you, again, expected to find freedom. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really true. The, the, the idea of you bringing those hang-ups with you and there's a personal story that runs alongside this like larger political story that that, yeah. that they don't necessarily run in tandem. You know, like I was very aware that when I when I moved to London from a much more conservative, positive sort of rural background uh, mm. in the north, that I was expecting this sudden flourishing of freedom myself. Yeah. Um, but it took a long long time to undo some of the other things that I'd like, yeah, learned it, it, processing it. And actually, in some ways, even within that sort of yeah that rural conservative community. Um, there was a lot more um, sex was better <laughs> for, for, for in my teenage years. You know, there was, there was, there was kind of a queerness and that that actually didn't actually exist in London when I when I moved there. At least when I first moved there, it took me a long time to find. Um, and I, I became a lot more hung up on these things in that new space. And I also think on on that issue of the of the penal code, there's something people don't have to be prosecuted for for these laws to have yeah. actually massive effects in society yeah. like when i was growing up there yeah. was this law section 28 which was um an educational law which prevented teachers from discussing homosexuality in schools and that was that was oh. um bought in you know when i was a couple of years old and it was in place for my entire um my entire education yeah. um and no one was ever prosecuted and under under it at all as far as i'm yeah. aware and yet the effect that it had upon mm. teaching in schools and the support that was given to LGBTQ people was absolutely huge, completely shaped sort of um, the approach and gave gave leave to a lot of people to not actually offer any sort of support at all for LGBTQ people. So I think, yeah, that's another aspect of, of, of these yeah. things is it takes, yeah, it can take time for communities to recover from that. Well, I mean, it's interesting yeah. with, um, with Section 28, which yeah, basically covered my entire period in education it came in in 1988 which was the year after i started primary school and was abolished in 2003 is the year i graduated from university so entire period uh, had this law like basically preventing the promotion of homosexuality in schools and by libraries and other public bodies um wow. i was in kyrgyzstan uh, a few years ago and the kyrgyz parliament were trying to put through um basically a version of the russian laws about gay propaganda um and it initially got kicked out of the kyrgyz parliament for being a basically word for word copy of the russian version they went back and just said look can you rewrite this in kyrgyz please um so they came back with a kyrgyz version um and uh the one deputy who said look i'm a straight man i'm married with children but i think this is wrong basically got smeared as like a, a homosexual by the kyrgyz media um, and people making the case for this legislation said, look, it's not just places like Russia that have this law. Britain also has this law, like referring to Section 28. Uh, so it's, you know, also the enlightened, tolerant West, like they have these laws too. And again, similar thing. Uh, the law ended up not going through the Kyrgyz parliament. It sort of got overwhelmingly passed twice uh, and then just sort of kicked into the long grass. Uh, but it still made life immeasurably worse for queer people in in well, Kyrgyzstan. So yeah, I just wanted to bring that into the conversation. Um, Hugh, I'm going to turn back to you again. Um, although Daryl, if you want to sort of come in with anything analogous in your work, I'd be interested to hear about it. But Hugh, I wanted to ask you um, about the podcast uh, with Ben Miller called Bad Gays and the book you published based on the show recently. 
Um, why is it important to document these these darker sides of, of gay history? Um, and, you know, how do you deal with people who say that you maybe shouldn't be doing that? Um, well, the podcast sort of came out of kind of what I was talking about, uh, we were talking about earlier on, which is this, this sort of, uh, now this sort of quite flat, positive depiction of LGBTQ people as entirely pure and good and these sort of fairy godmothers who, are, who have been granted to straight society to like liven the place off of it. Um, and that we were seeing fewer and fewer sort of more complex of the more complex depictions of, of gay people. And so we d- we want us to do a history podcast that sort of addressed some of those stories that aren't really told because every year you get, a, I don't know, a Pride Month or whatever, a, the the, the uh, broadsheets would like run a top 10 gay gay icons from history perhaps, or you'll get something like that in like a gay magazine. And th- and it's the same faces and all you know, like very important people, but, um, you know, the sort of Harvey Milks or, um, or what have you of the world. And we were like, actually, we, there's more interesting conversations to be had we felt for like amongst ourselves as queer people. Uh, one of the interesting things about the podcast is when we started it, me and Ben were having this conversation and I remember we were filming, we were recording the first season and uh, Ben, Ben was, I, I, I said like, oh, I think we got, I think we got like 50 people who could listen to this. And Ben was like, don't be ridiculous. There's at least a hundred people who could listen to this. And it's been downloaded. Like, I don't know, like oh, I think one and a half million times now, like, the huge amounts of downloads because I think people are already ready for those conversations amongst the queer community. Like they want to hear the more interesting stories about like how fucked up. Sorry, can I swear here? How, how, about how bad gay people can be? <laughs> um, we might get the bleep and, machine out, Hugh. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And how, how, uh, how true, how, yeah. So, so there's clearly like a huge audience for it. Um, and so, we wanted to tell those stories because really the, the, the conversation in the podcast quite often comes back to actually telling not just the stories of gay people or, 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 or queer people or trans people, but how those identities came to be created historically. So it's kind of a history of, of queerness as well as a history of queer people. And in telling that story, like actually the, the bad guys, let's just say the bad gays are actually just as important, if not more important than the people who were consciously you know, we're, 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 we're perhaps heroes, you know, you can look back and find these heroes, but the influence they had on history at the time often was was minor or they've since been neglected massively, whereas the bad guys quite often people were sort of forming in in the, these ideas of, of sexuality, they had these complex relationships, relationships to the sex gender system, or that their relationship with the sex gender system at the time can tell us a huge amount about how, um, how homosexuality was sort of invented. So, um, and, and how it exists today. So, so for example, in the first season, we we covered Ernst Rehm, who was uh, a lot of people. A lot of people sort of, I think, didn't really know his story until we we sort of covering it. Not that it was hidden, but um, he's not the sort of gay man that he uses as, as a hero because he was the first openly homosexual politician in in the history of the world, uh, and he was also the leader of the Nazi paramilitary organization, the SA. Um, and there's lots lots going on there that you can talk about you know like why why did this how did this man manage to be both a a nazi a leading nazi and openly homosexual and there's an entire story about you know one of the strands that helped form the the idea of the homosexual identity in europe being a masculinist one being warlike being misogynistic all these sort of aspects that actually allowed him you know it makes perfect sense when you know the history to understand why he could could reconcile those two identities so, so yeah, we want to tell those stories because actually I think if we tell the, the complex stories and uh, the stories of often quite terrible people as part of our LGBTQ history, um, it gives us actually a more accurate, more rounded view of LGBTQ history and ho- hopefully can stop us making some of the same mistakes again as we see obviously in, in Europe at the moment, the relationship between specifically uh, white gay men and the far right is, is you know extremely relevant conversation. Yeah, and Daryl, um, you know, maybe with regards to to your own work, I mean, you know, you're working in in a context where the the conversation around LGBT issues and people is is maybe different. Um, and I mean, I've certainly felt this writing about like trans people and characters, as well as like nonfiction histories. 
you know, when you're dealing with a context where there's more kind of like social or institutional prejudice, you know, how do you navigate the sort of need to create characters that are sort of like realistic and compelling and complicated um, whilst also maybe trying to sort of navigate the problem of, of, you know, putting out less positive representations into a society where there are fewer representations overall? Yeah, and where your work sure. might be I, interpreted in these sort of negative stereotypes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, this is such an interesting question. And I feel like in this short story collection I'm putting together right now, in which I do kind of more explicitly tackle queer life, um, I do think what I'm trying to investigate really is this deep ambivalence that sits within the heart of queer Singaporean life. Mainly because, again, like, on one hand, yes, we did have this penal code hovering over us. On the other hand, yes, it was never really enforced on the current generation. But then again, can we not deny the effect it's had on us? But also, has it had an effect on us? And this constant back and forth um, between... Isn't life not more or less good and okay and completely bearable in Singapore versus... Why are so many of us still afraid to come out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? And I think all of this back and forth really just culminates not so much in like a plus minus situation, but really in a state of almost non identity, you know, that is deep, this is deep, deep silence that rests within the very heart of queer Singapore life. And I feel like if I were to try and tackle the question of queer Singapore life, I would have to reckon with the silence and how people live with the silence constantly because it's in the silence where, you know, people can find comfort. It's in the silence where we don't have to ask ourselves questions that are too deep, you know, and that wouldn't disturb or derail our sense of peace, our ability to live life on a daily, you know. And the more I find myself going deeper and deeper into his ambivalence, the more I find myself as a writer being taken to more interesting places. Especially when it comes to, I guess, the decision of how positively or negatively I ought to portray queer life and queer people. And I feel like that's the more interesting route. And I like to think I've done some kind of justice to that particular journey. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm, thank you. Um... Just one more, more question, which, uh, again, I'm sort of aiming at Hugh first, but um, Daryl, I'll, I'll come back to you as well. Um, Hugh, I recently saw your um, film debut, uh, which is a, a half an hour film called Ungentle that you co-directed with Onyeka Ikwa. Um, can we talk about why you wanted to work in this medium and how it's changed your practice? Um one of the things I've been thinking, I'm, I moved out of the, uh, London, I left the UK about five years ago and to, to move to, to Barcelona, um, which has um, really changed my relationship, I think, quite a lot of my work. And one of the things I've been thinking about a lot in that process is ideas of like escapism within gay literature and um, and uh, terribly unfashionable to say these days, but like ideas of beauty within gay literature. And... I was given the opportunity to, to sort of produce some something for this uh, arts organization, Studio Voltaire. And I, I said, I sort of jumped to the opportunity and be like, I really would love to make a film because I'm, I'm really interested in uh, sort of reintroducing some, so, some of these ideas of sort of beauty and aesthetic sort of, um, uh, like an aesthetic undercurrent to my work that I think when I was living in London, it really didn't have. Um, uh, and and so the film the film takes on quite a lot of my sort of previous research into the relationship in the UK between uh, people who work for the security services, um, and especially agents, spies, and and gay men, and and this recurring thing that came up with the podcast and another research I've done. Where you, whenever you start start to research anything to do with the British security services, especially before the Second World War, uh, everyone was everyone was gay. And they were all at it with each other. And I was like, this is, this is very interesting. Why is that? And sort of going into that sort of relationship between, you know, recruitment and the private school system and class and all these sort of things tied together in this very messy entanglement. Um, and I wanted to tell that story, which is, which is, uh, 
for me, a fascinating one, but can be quite dry. It sort of tends to be the sort of world of these sort of, you know, very thick, um, uh, very well best-selling um, sort of history paperbacks that you get in airports about, about spies, you know, and, and, and Stalin's Englishmen and all, that, all these sort of books, um, which have a very, they're very interesting, but they, they quite often only have, let's say, like a straight affect. They can be quite dry, quite sort of military history. Um, but one of the things I found so fascinating in the research is like that the, the, all these stories and the way that the men, if they did talk about them, managed to talk about them, um, but just implicit in the in the stories themselves are just completely like dripping with this like amazing queerness and horniness. And these guys, they just they they were driven by like you know these horribly tangled relationships of their own class background and with England and with these boys who they fell in love with and they, they yearned for and. And that sex was really at the heart of that, you know, and uh, the the most famous, I guess, of the stories of the defectors was the Cambridge Five, and especially Guy Burgess, who was sort of looked upon as this sort of um, mad genius of the British espionage world. And that so much of his story was specifically driven by the fact that he was just incredibly horny the entire time, and he just had a lover after lover after lover, and he was getting thrown out of jobs because he was cruising too much or being caught by the cops in bathrooms and all these sort of stories. That just that seemed that that color seemed to be missing from a lot of the representations that I read. Um, so I want to tell retell that story. I, I actually tell a fictionalized version of a lot of those sort of stories, um, but using using the English landscape as a sort of um, uh, foil to discuss to, to also discuss the, the idea of beauty and desire and sexuality and and yearning and things that these men had. Um, and that was something that I felt like was I sort of ideally suited to making making something visual on the film. And I think that's really going to change. Like I'm I'm, I'm writing a novel at the moment. I've just started a couple of chapters in, and I'm really sort of obsessed in that and thinking about it in a filmic way and and the relationship with the image and the idea of beauty and the seduction of beauty and how that sort of um, how seduction of of the aesthetic can really drive drive a gay man completely mad with desire a lot of the time um and also i think i mean i definitely want to write a lot more for for film and one thing i've definitely learned is um is how much the image can do and, and the, my one problem i think with that film is um there's too many words there should be more yeah. more images and fewer words yeah i mean as as writers um who make film uh yeah it, you know you can end up making quite rightly films i mean the, the films yeah. i've made have been quite similar you know the sort of script comes first and the images second and yeah maybe if you switch that relationship around what what happens um but also switch that into my books and being like actually ooh. the the images that you can conjure in books can actually bring a huge amount uh, of narrative to it they're not just scene setting like the images and i i think i think i already knew that in my literature i think like scene the the the, the visual images and drive a lot of my my books more than perhaps um dialogue uh, or or plot <laughs> dare uh, i say um but that yeah like the visualization becomes like an important part of that and creating these sort of worlds so, well, yeah. well daryl um i'd sort of like to ask you i mean you've talked about some of the writers that have influenced you uh but i i've read your forthcoming uh short fiction collection be your own bay uh and you know in it um it felt quite cinematic to me you know there's uh there's a line of um largely but not exclusively like east asian slow cinema that runs through directors like yasashira ozu through to um apachat ponguera sethical um and a number of others uh, and i felt something of their sort of gentleness their slowness the kind of texture of those films even the kind of weather that works very well on screen also comes across in your book so i wondered if if you know if you have anything to say about your relationship with uh cinema or, or pop music maybe For um, sure. and that has an influence on your work or, or something you might work in yeah i think i think as a singaporean our relationship with international media as a whole is very is very interesting because we are inundated by it and if we were to choose one over the other one being international one over local i think most of us would actually I don't go international. I don't know why. Don't ask me why. It could be snobbery. It could be I don't know. It could be cultural cringe at play. I'm not sure. But um, for me, 
when I have discovered, I guess, certain filmmakers or musicians or whatever, they often take me out of a country that is ultimately very, very small. Some might say too small. And in this short story collection, I have allowed myself to kind of pay homage to a lot of these artists who I felt have given me a way out. But also not just a way out, but also a way in, ironically. Um, and one of those filmmakers in particular is Hong Sang Su. He's this Korean filmmaker who's extremely prolific. And there's just such a beauty and a, a, there's such a natural cadence to his films that, you know, there's always like really besotted me. And I, yeah, I've, I've always been enchanted by his world and just the very honest way that people talk to one another. And even though some might say that his films are very much kind of defined by kind of norm core, um, there is inevitably in all of his films a very hidden but eventually revealed structure that ultimately is the reveals the hand of an aesthete at play. You know, he's not interested in merely capturing daily scenes. He's also interested in structuring them in a way that by the time you reach the end of a film, you see the form in its fullness and then you get to kind of appreciate the work they have actually very carefully put together. And um, yeah, and I think one of those films in particular that I was really inspired by um, is this film called Right Now, Wrong Then. And it's a film that literally repeats itself. And the reason why it repeats itself is just so we can... It's like a, an act of largesse, really. You know, authorial largesse. He wants his characters to kind of save themselves. And I feel like that moves me very, very deeply very, very deeply, I, I, when I think of my characters, I do think of them almost too preciously sometimes. And when I saw that film, I saw in it a kind of model as well for my own characters to save themselves, to relive and give themselves another chance at life. And I feel like, I don't know, sometimes, you know, in the country that I live in, second chances are very hard to come by, you know? And if I could just give my characters that opportunity, I, I, would, I would do that. And I wouldn't have known to do that if I hadn't you know, had the privilege of being in contact with a filmmaker like Hong Sang Soo and all of his work. And I think I'm actually seeing his latest film on Saturday with my lover. And um, yeah, I just feel like being able to be transported out of a country that is ultimately very small and sometimes equally small minded, I feel like it does give me a nice sense of reprieve and that, that's basically been my relationship with, you know, other media, basically. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got a few minutes left, so I'm going to ask you one more question. Um, and, you know, we've talked about, like, why you've wanted to write about LGBT people and subjects. Um, so do you both sort of still feel a compulsion to do this? Uh, what would it mean for you to write about something other than LGBT subjects? And is that even possible? Can we even speak of an other from LGBT subjects? Um, Daryl, I think I'll ask you first. I'll come back to, to Hugh. Yeah. Um, I guess partly because, again, um, of just the regulation on queer media, I've actually had to kind of navigate this quite fairly early on in my work. So even though, yes, I have said all my books do begin with a queer character, they do ultimately... My, my books do eventually feature a larger cast of characters that would pre be predominantly heterosexual, I suppose. Um, I do have this novel called Lovely Alone There that really at the heart of it is about a marriage, right? And between a man and a woman and how it kind of comes together, tries to stay together and ultimately falls apart. And I do think there is a value <laughs> observing the the the... the, the the coming and falling apart of a marriage from a queer perspective, I think that's been very interesting because, I don't know, from my point of view, I'm able to kind of look at heterosexual life and see how storied it is and how venerated and mythologized it is in Singapore and how people just kind of fall into it without question, you know? And so that's been an interesting <laughs> journey for me. And I really enjoyed that journey and seeing them fall apart was great. So that's all I can say, really. Yeah. All right, and and Hugh, how about you? It's funny because as I get older and learn more about the heterosexual world, 
I, I really increasingly think that actually, he, he, like, heterosexuality is so uh, so much the creation of like a specific. It's con so so contingent on a specific like social order. Yeah. Like, I just I just don't think heterosexuality is like it's the norm now. But I don't think it's like normal. Like, I don't think it's natural. And so as I tried to like. The, the more I sort of like write, like queerness is, I think, like kind of the human condition. Like people are just attracted to strange things. Like the idea of just being like, oh, just singularly attracted to this one type of person is to relate around this like specific idea of gender and these sort of norms, you know, like this is a norm that's like enforced with rigid iron discipline and all the tools of the state and, and society and culture to like force you into that. And, and, we're making efforts to try and break that down. But I think without those things, like I think in people's hearts, there's a queerness in even, even the most heterosexual person There's the stuff that doesn't fit with the, that, that sort of sex and gender order, the strange things that they find desirable. They might not talk about it. Like that, that's kind of what heterosexuality is, is, is limiting yourself to not exploring and talking and acknowledging those things. But like, I think we're all, there is a queerness, I guess, in, in human existence. Um, so, so when I've tried to write outside of writing about specifically gay male life today, which is just as like limited by norms and st those sort of structures, like get get gay gayness, like gay male homosexuality, is just an out an out uh, an, a flowering out of heterosexuality, but it's the same sort of concept, binary concept of the world. But when I tried to to move outside of that, so like my last novel was called Unknown Language, and it's about a sort of based on the writings of a, 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 a 11th century mystic nun who, who called Hildegard von Bingen, uh, an amazing um, polymath, a musician, a med medical doctor, all these sort of things, and a, a, a mystic. And uh, I sort of wrote a book based around her mystic visions, which is kind of, I guess, a sort of a bit fantasy sci-fi, you could say, sort of um, based in some sort of strange future, future Earth in which she's escaping um, the last judgment of God. Though when I sort of wrote about that, it just she just naturally emerged as a queer character because she existed in a world in which that sort of, those sort of heterosexual norms had begun to break break down. So whether she was queer or not as a person, her life became like a queer story once she escapes uh -huh. from the city and society in that way and stuff. So I think yeah, that's part of the the sort of aspect. And I think, but I think personally for me, what I would like to, I'm more, in my writing, I'm always sort of each next project, I kind of focus on my failings of earlier oh, yeah. projects. And so, so what I really want to sort of get into more is more writing about the mean, minutiae of, of the interpersonal relationships between gay men, but also between queer people in general and between queer people and, and heterosexuals. Um, I'm drawn more and more to writing specifically about that because because I know that my sort of um, my urge is to uh, learn how to uh, to write those relationships through dialogue, which is not something I've been particularly good at, I'd say, in the past. Um, so yeah, I don't see myself moving away necessarily from that, but but I do feel the more I write, the more my pretty, pretty sort of the the more my categories that I bring to the game break down through the process of writing okay well look that's all very interesting thank you so much both of you um that's all we've got time for unfortunately i feel we could have talked for a good deal longer but um yeah we have to uh, have to leave it there for today so hugh daryl thank you so much for joining me today thank you and thank, uh, you. thank you all for watching i've been your i've been your host juliet jakes take care and see you soon goodbye <laughs>